Hey everybody, a couple things before we start the show today. First off, a couple people left reviews and I really appreciate it. I thought it would be kind of cool to read reviews that I get just to acknowledge the time that people take to write those reviews. So I'm going to go ahead and read two of these reviews for this time around. The first one is by somebody who goes by the name Vineet, and they left it on Stitcher. Vineet says, This podcast is just amazing. From the interactive format to guiding people just enough to get to a point of comfort where they share some of the most intimate experiences is just fascinating to watch. The creator needs to start a Patreon so we can get you a better microphone. More episodes, please. Thanks, Vineet. The second review, left by Ash Hemovich 80 on Podbean, says, Very real and good-hearted sauce right there. People need to hear realism. Thanks, Ash. I think this is something that I'll keep on doing in the future, so if you end up writing a review, I will definitely do my best to read it on the air. The second thing I want to touch on pertains to today's episode specifically. Traditionally, in previous episodes, I've tried to interview and edit in such a way that results in a kind of story told by a singular person. Well, I got requests to include myself into these episodes a little bit more, so I decided to give it a shot. So in today's episode, this is actually more of a conversation, or more specifically, tidbits of a conversation, where I definitely include myself. In fact, the first part of the episode probably has more of me than the other person, but it eventually evens out and we hear a lot more from them towards the middle and towards the end. So again, this is just kind of an experiment that was suggested to me by all of you, and I hope you enjoy. Let me know what you think. Have you read uh, Michael Pollan's new book, The How to Change Your Mind? I'm about 60 pages into it right now. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm about 40-ish or so. And he struggled with, like, what to call it. And, I mean, psychedelic is fine enough, but I think the problem is there's never going to be a word good enough to, to really get the rest of the zeitgeist, to really get the rest of uh, on board with, with what it really means or, or how deep it goes. No, for sure. And and that's what he kind of talks about in his book is, you know, we're wanting to use the word entheogens, right? But the fact is, that's, psychedelic is kind of the perfect term. It just carries yeah. with it stigma from uh, right. earlier days. And so that's just more a, that's more a hang up on our part as a society than, than anything else. Psychotropic presents Vox. That's what's still so compelling to me about dimethyltryptamine. I mean, so many people are like, oh, well, this is just like salvia. And I'm like, yeah, but do you take prescription meds? Are you, did you drink before this? Because, I mean, that alters the effects intensely. And I, but the problem too, no one is built physiologically the same way either. So a lot of, a lot of the things I've tried to find, I mean, I'm glad there is a lexicon for for people out there who have that experience of breaking the third wall, as so it's called. You're speaking specifically of DMT? Mm -hmm. I know with that stuff, I've, I can only break through. The way that I ended up doing it was I kind of basically created a gravity bong out of a Gatorade bottle, and I still think yeah. it's smoke, because it's hard to take it all in. I, I remember trying to use a meth pipe, you know, like with a bulb yeah. and everything, and it's yeah. so hard to take enough in before you start getting somewhat overwhelmed by the effects. Yeah. And by that time, yeah. I feel like you kind of peak, like there's a peak time. So what I found was I basically created a gravity bong out of a medium sized Gatorade bottle. And it would, you know, within, if I could have a big enough lung full within the first go round, um, I was 
almost guaranteed to break through. If I could do yeah. two, then for sure I would be in it, and I'd be basically like, please, God, I hope I don't wake up retarded. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's weird how that is almost a concern. Like, you you are aware that you almost feel like you could have a psychotic break experiencing these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so specifically for me, almost every time I went into that and I actually broke through and I started experiencing the entities and the weird environments and stuff, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. there was always that thought that, you know, I am very much alone. It seemed like it was taking place inside of my head, but at the same time, it was taking place in a deeper realm of reality. It was this weird place where it was both inside and outside of my head, almost yeah. like a, a wormhole within my head leading to what? another place. There's something going on with consciousness, dude. I know all the neuroscientists and and, and, and then like pollen, people trying to, I, I haven't gotten through the book still fully, but it really does feel like it's a force just like gravity or anything else out there. Something that is just omnipresent in, in the ether. Yeah, know. no, for sure. And this is something that I think about. Um, I have a degree in behavioral neuroscience. And so one of the things that we did touch on, which you don't really actually touch on big time, it's more physiological mechanisms that we were touching on, but you do start to get into the idea of consciousness and what a big problem it is. Literally, it's called the the hard problem of consciousness, right? If we knew every circuit in the brain and how it worked and how every circuit fed into every other one, to the point, I mean, we could predict behavior, like down to a T and everything, and, right, and predict true. the thoughts that coincide with those brain mechanisms, we still wouldn't understand how consciousness or sentience or experience arises from the physiological mechanisms of the brain. The fact that you're having an experience, as far as we know, the way we understand the brain, it shouldn't mm-hmm. exist, but right. it does. And so when you're talking about the idea of consciousness as being a fundamental part of the universe, I've personally come to the conclusion that it has to be. The fact is, is somehow matter, which is that it's organized inside of our brain, is organized in such a way that allows sentience to arise. And the only way that can happen is if the universe allows that to happen. Because the fact is, is we're not separate from the universe. We are a part of it. We are literally like water observing itself in an ocean of water and uh our consciousness is a part of that the water is allowing that consciousness to arise because that consciousness is a part of the water it's interesting to to see how all these elements interplay with one another and like realizing too yeah the brain itself does feel like the actual physical evidence of consciousness how strange that there's this hyperbolic pocket of information and that there's quite a few of them and they're emitting biofeedback frequencies to one another. One of the things that really allows us to kind of understand that there's something more to this thing called consciousness and this idea that it might be tied into spirituality is is psychedelics like DMT and almost every drug in general because if you... To me, you kind of look at it and you look at the drug experience and and when you start to understand a little bit about the cell and the synapse and neurotransmitters and stuff and how drugs actually mimic certain neurotransmitters or at least alter the way that cells function, you start to see that or you could draw the metaphor that that you're actually treating the brain like a stereo system with a bunch of knobs where... As exactly. you ingest the drug, that drug is actually allowing you to turn one of the dials on the stereo system, whether it be bass or treble or right. whatnot, so, uh, up or down. That's a good analogy. Yeah. That's a really good analogy. I, I mean, I think that would help a lot of other people with trying to conceptualize how, like, especially since we're, we're just like a big walking sensor. If we can t- fine-tune the inner workings of our senses, then, like, it'll yield a lot of interesting things that we didn't probably think were possible before. That's the sense that I get. That's why, that's why psychedelics feel so immense. 
it feels like you do get to touch beyond in, in some way that was not in access to humans or as like as much as or as widely to humans as it was before. I think I see what yeah. you're saying. Are you thinking that psychedelics, they can actually um, allow you to tap into things that you didn't have access to previously or do they just make it more accessible? I think both. I I understood so many things about myself and the nature of reality when I every time I come back. Like it, it I feel like I have more connections happening in my brain and I've unwound in a sort of way. I'm more in touch with the inner workings of of my own consciousness every time that I do it. It's like a nice reset and it's refreshing. I mean, and it's very much similar to any of the analogies of shedding a skin and like kind of and just growth in general. And so I, I've just always been really curious. I want to see more results from EEG, from just like brainwave patterns of what's happening to you when especially on DMT. I don't know, like, that, that one was just the strongest, right? I still haven't done salvia, and I haven't done some some other intense uh, psychotropics, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's just, it, do, it did really make me feel like for one of the first times in my life that I, I was in touch with something that I feel like I was deep down always kind of looking for. So the first time that I came back from DMT, it was really hard. I wanted to be back out there. I didn't care to be here because I, I was, I felt like people were really shallow and really materialistic. And I was already on a path of unmaterialism at that point. And so doing DMT, like unfortunately, I took back some of the wrong lessons from it, mostly because I had for what was called like by this. I met this guy who's a friend of my brother and he had spent some time at a Buddhist monastery. This was a couple of years ago and uh, when I was deep in my depression and I was telling him sort of these notions of just feeling that I was in touch with something more immense than, than the daily life that we just get hunkered into. And he was telling me that it sounded like I had Zen sickness. And just hearing that phrase just like lifted all of the all of the notions and the things that I was holding on to. And that was one of actually, I mean, I wasn't even on any drugs at that moment, but I felt like I was because that notion just hit me so hard. Repeat that, that, that word. What did he say? Zen sickness. Zen sickness? Yeah. Like, what is, describe that. I mean, it's basically feeling like, it's, it's weird because it's like, it's like depression. I was depressed, but I wasn't sad. I was just okay with things shutting down and I stopped trying. I, I was overwhelmed with pursuing things that I felt like I was supposed to pursue or feeling like I was supposed to make my life into something. And it was interesting because this was also happening at the time in my life where you hear about people having a, a Saturn return or what, what's that? Isn't that the phrase? Are you familiar I, with that? I have never heard that. It's something, I mean, apparently your body does go through something physiologically between the ages of 25 and 30 as well. And so I think this is accounting for some of that. And man, it, it fucking hit me like a ton, ton of bricks. It was just the most intense existential depression I've ever experienced. And there's something that, but, but doing DMT and doing psychedelics allowed me to have more inward journeys where I could actually go back and revisit some of my memory that led me to the thoughts and the way of thinking that got me into that depressive way of mind. And as soon as I was able to see who that person was at those times in my memory banks, I was able to essentially, in a way, give that person a hug and and move on and let go of what was holding me back. A lot of things helped too, like when I was depressed, like Jung's notions of, um, of 
self-alchemy, individuation, and just focusing on oneself. So to round this back to Zen sickness, Zen sickness is basically a feeling like you've done, you've done all that you could do to try to be as good of a person as you would hope to be, like as morally and ethically right as I would hope to be. I just felt like during that time that I was constantly letting myself and other people down and I couldn't catch a fucking break. And unfortunately, there were social circumstances that led me to believe that I wasn't living up to other people's standards. And so that made me even more depressed, which just makes it worse and worse and worse. I was getting to a point where I started scoping out some places way up on the hill that would probably be a good place to kind of, like, disappear forever kind of thing. I mean, I guess, to be completely honest, a place to die. There was a couple of places like that in Oregon that struck me. And then that that call from the void was so heavy that it did basically have me running back to the city to try to live again, to start over again. And so Zen sickness was like this plateau. Zen sickness is like, it's feeling like being just done and wanting to just die on the plateau, but life is a mountain and it, it will just keep fucking rising and it doesn't stop after you die. That's why I'm so interested in consciousness because I feel like we are still going to have some notion of this self that has developed on this terrestrial plane and somehow there might be some trickle over because that's what it felt like when you experience DMT or any heavy psychedelic, you feel like you die. And so what happens after you die? And so realizing there is these other planes, that, these other modes of thought where you're just matter floating. You don't even have a body. Like you could look down, but it's like virtual reality. There's no body there. You're just an observational point in the universe. So it makes you really start to wonder how that translates to other entity and other entities and and like what intelligence actually is. And a lot of times I found that that intelligence and consciousness was also conduit, very much like water in the same way. So that's why I thought it was also really interesting with most of my experiences on DMT, every time that I really start breaking through and was in the universal conduit of all these other sentient beings, we were all having the same thoughts at the same time. That's why no one needed to use any vocal cords or that there was no need for this uh, terrestrial fear that I was bringing to the table when everyone else there was on the same plane. All I had to do was just let go and be absorbed into everything. And so, like, and maybe that's what people get scared about is losing their sense of autonomy and their sense of self. But I already see myself and everyone else that I ever meet and talk to anyways. I mean, I've been telling people ever since the beginning of this year, a lot of my experiences have felt disassociative and out of body. I'm kind of just watching myself go through these things. I'm maybe six feet above my head to the right watching this human do all these things. You're kind of, you're going through life like this kind of, in a, in a kind of a, an abstract sort of a way? Always, even right now. I just feel like I can feel things in a different way. You just really, I really start to question and wonder about how much we can sense. We're given this incredible ability to to perceive things in the universe. I mean, just like the way that so many other animals are specialized on this planet. And so ours, there's something going on in our in our frontal cortex that's really compelling. I would say that you could... You could actually augment that statement. Um, the, you know, we're given yeah. this special place where we're perceiving ourselves in the universe. That it, statement could suggest that that one thinks that they are separate from the universe. They're an entity moving through oh, the universe. When really, sure. the, the universe, we are the universe. You could say that no, we are, right. we're literally the universe perceiving itself. Right. Um, no, no, and I, and I, didn't, I didn't mean that at all as being separate. And in fact, I mean that quite the opposite, as being fully integrated. We are the embodiment. So what you're you're getting is psychedelics allow you to perceive that integration, how you are fully embodied. Yeah, yeah. Um, like like just like in a stronger way than than we allow ourselves. Because I think what I guess what I'm getting at is I just noticed that all of us when we're doing our day to day routines and we just get 
stuff and these really monotonous, awful, really fucking slow politics. I mean, it's strange that so many people feel like, why is society so slow to catch up? You know, but then, I mean, obviously there's so many differences between so many people and their upbringing and and what makes you, you, but, but I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I I do kind of wish more people would partake of psychedelics because I feel like it would help them see more how we are more connected and how empathy really will tie more things together and will also boost everything that we could ever imagine as being fruitful and, and productive of a society, of a progressive society. I'm always, like, amused by the Kardashev scale. You know, like, these, these, uh, you, have you heard of that? No, I haven't. It's, um, it's like... These, Repeat, what is it called again? The, the Kardashev scale, I think is what it's called. It's, it's these scales of civilization that have garnered the intelligence and the organization to achieve things, like, building the Dyson sphere. Have you heard of that? So what comes to mind for me is uh, that you're a type a type 1, type 2 civilization. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, like that kind of shit. Yeah, exactly. Can you describe like, that a little bit? That we're maybe right now at a type 1 civilization. Type 2, I, my general impression of this, because I think it's sort of, I think these, I don't think it's like, a, it's obviously not like a real thing. It's like this sort of projected notion of how society could be if we were working better together. Like, I guess you could say... The society that exists in Star Trek The Next Generation is like Kardash- is like a scale two. It's like when we finally worked out, we, we've all worked together to explore space together with technology that is beyond what we imagined kind of thing. The way that I remember it was, so you have type zero through type four, and I, I think okay. it's like type zero was, and it's all based on what type of energy sources you're using. So like the lowest okay, so type. Okay, really like, based off of resources. Yeah. Um, that, that's the way that I remember it. I could be totally okay. wrong, um, but real realistically, it seemed like type zero was just using things like fossil fuels, or maybe not even that, maybe just natural resources like trees or whatever, and then you bumped up the level where you're using fossil fuels, using the planet. Yeah. And then you jump up to where you're actually using your local star. And then right. you're using the galaxy, right? And then right. you kind That's of bump up. Yeah. I got you. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. That makes more sense. It sounds like you know more about it than I do. <laughs> no, I mean, this was a little while ago when I when I read about it. But it was a really interesting thing. And it seemed like it was. Because then it starts to tie into things like the Dyson Sphere and stuff. Um, yeah, which I mean, which that largely could very well probably not work. But more so just like this notion of us as a, as a civilization working more together to achieve these monumental feats. And there's nothing to say that we're, we're not going to still like have conflicts in the future, but it definitely at the moment they feel like incredibly insurmountable. All the conflicts that we have, it's just a really tough time. So this is kind of an interesting idea then. I feel like when you when you start to get into psychedelic type conversation, literally like what we're having right now, right. you come right. across a couple of different trains of thought. You have one train of thought that I'd imagine uh, some psychedelic proponents would be like, no, we need to become more involved, like get back in touch with our mother earth and, and down to our roots and everything. Mm-hmm. And these are the mm-hmm. more, maybe the more communal type people. Um, And then you have the other type of person that is like, no, we are going to expand our consciousness and we're going to expand ourselves to to populate the entire universe. And we're going to make it so that the the universe is fully conscious through us as almost kind of like uh, nodes of perception throughout the universe. And that would entail things like Star Trek and populating other star systems and right, artificial right. intelligence and basically just spreading ourselves as far and wide as possible. 
those are very two very different notions. One is reverting ourselves back to a more what my, one might call a holistic uh, civilization, yeah. more of an earthy. Yeah. Yes, yes. I don't know. I, mean, I don't think I agree with either of those trains of thought. It's interesting to me that that people think that it's those extremes, I guess. Because, I mean, we, we, need, we need the Earth, but we're definitely going to want to explore outward. But there's, there's got to be a balance between the two because, like, you can't just have one or the other. And I think it's kind of strange for it, – it's like taking sides anyway. Like, the, the, the sort of dualistic thought of uh, the extreme of, of any sort of situation, I've – like, I can get both sides, but I don't understand why people take on those narratives. So what would you say? What would be a happy medium? I mean, it's it's interesting because so much of what this planet already is, there's so many resources that we're just not tapping into. It's the field around us. There's energy all around us, and Tesla was aware of it. And so many I mean, so many of us are aware of it, but... I feel like we're just not using the technology that we do have access to enough to, like, to have it work with our knowledge of the Earth as well as we've done so far. I, it, it's hard to describe because, like, they, I mean, the happy medium that I see is kind of just, like, more awareness on both ends. And, and knowing that, I mean, it's not going to... It's not going to fit very well to do either extreme either because because then you'll have separate groups. You'll have the people that are like, well, we do want to pursue technology. If you guys want to go back to the earth and just shovel mud around, that's fine. You know, you know what I mean. Like that's like how far that stuff goes. And maybe that's when things get too political. I just feel like the notions of what psychedelics can offer is finding finding space and, and ways for the technology to be integrated with our lives in such a way that maybe will sort of uh, resemble weird biomechanical integrations in the future that we've, that we've kind of touched upon in science fiction. I mean, that's a really interesting question because I'm not even really sure where to place what my answer would be to that. Is that the narrative that you hear from most people after they've had an intense experience? No. Okay. So, so where I get that from when I have conversations with people, like when you when you think about psychedelics, oftentimes you think about like the hippie, kind of the um, the 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 person that likes living in a commune. And those people were very uh, peace, love, and, and and flowers. You know, like the flower children. And it seems like, at least in the narrative that I've created in my head that they were much more into nature. And oftentimes, you take psychedelics in a, nat in a natural setting, out in yeah. nature, uh, yeah. to help commune with nature, you know? Right, right. And uh, oftentimes, if you were to go from that point, or at least, again, in my head, if you were to go from that point of nature and say you were to go into a New York subway, you could, I could easily see that transitioning into a bad trip because all of a sudden you went through this place that is seemingly beautiful to a place that is much more, in my mind, grimy, although I've never seen a New York City subway station. I can imagine that. Right. Um, although, then, although I will say, like, I mean, you said, you, you said you've had some lucid uh, hallucinations as well where you could control them. In a way, yes. Um, specifically on DMT, I the the way that I control one, I'm not totally controlling the entities. But what I can do is I can oh, no, kind no, of no. aid. I can kind of aid the the emotional response that they give yeah. me. When I've smoked DMT in the past, what usually happens is I'll dive into that realm, and the entities will start kind of unfolding out of tile blocks or something, right? Yeah, and right. they're going to start approaching me and trying to interact with me. And around that time, initially, I'll start to experience uh, nausea, and that nausea will kind of induce a little bit of fearfulness in me because I realize yeah. how high I am and how kind right. of helpless, and I 
there's right. a thought that I don't want to choke on my own vomit if I throw up. I've never thrown yeah. up. But the right. thought is there. And so there's fear that builds up a little bit. And when that fear right. builds up, those entities, they start to turn more malicious, almost right. like little right. little they're children. Children. Yeah, the yeah, children in a playground starting to poke you with sticks. And you start to realize that if there are enough children in the playground, they could actually hurt you or kill you. Yeah. And yep. they don't really realize what they're doing. No. They're just kind of like being this playful, <laughs> malicious thing. It's like a and, mild feedback. Yes, yes. So what happens is I, I've i learned that, no, I need to calm down. Those entities, as they're getting more malicious, yeah. they'll actually change color. They'll go from like a right? blue or a green yeah. to a red and like yeah, start getting more twitchy. Too. Yeah, more and twitchy and fidgety. And, and then... And- and that's what's so interesting is if, if you can also calm yourself. Yeah, like you were just about to say, like if you can recognize in that moment and chill out, everyone chills out. Yes, that's, they actually yeah. revert back into like a green or a blue and they calm yeah. back down and they start doing their sign language or handing you things or yeah. interacting with you in some way. And right, uh, right. So in that sense, I can control them, but by no means can I control like their hand movements or the fact that they're even coming. They just seem to continuously just pile on and pile on. Right. And, right, right. Uh, oh, I guess the, I guess the notion that I was coming to though was that people are so concerned with having a bad trip, but that's what I was getting at. That you are obviously also aware of that the bad trip is you. People need to confront their fear that's why that's why this stuff has been so great for psychotherapy as as far as i've understood and why i felt like it was good for my own psychotherapy i basically self-administered these experiences on myself to to overcome my fears like i really don't i feel more in touch and in tune with the nature of everything than ever before and i do i don't i'm more i feel i i feel like i have the conviction to be able to say that I feel more fascinated by death at this point than than fearful. You touched on the idea of psychotherapy, right? While it is extremely beneficial, it allows you to, using drugs, at, specifically psychedelics, as psychotherapy, it is beneficial, yeah. or it can be. But it yeah. can also kind of ride this line of being a hindrance uh, versus being helpful. And this is kind I mean, of the... That happened to me. Technically, that happened to me. Can you describe like that? that? Yeah, because like, that was kind of like what I was telling you earlier when I was telling you that I took back the wrong lessons from the first time that I did, that I did DMT, that I didn't want to come back. I wanted to stay there. I didn't want to come back to this plane of reality because I was sick of people and sick of myself. And so that's exactly what happened to me. I took the wrong lesson back, but that was my fault. I had to, And I had to do the work anyways to figure that out, just like everybody else does. And that's hard. But there are people there and other entities and beings to help. That's why I don't, that's why like those other realities, they're synonymous as above, so below. There's no hierarchy in intelligence. Emotional intelligence and, and having an openness to others is the key to growth. And so the more that I could let go and deal with that shit, the better off I was going to be. The more that I could work on those thoughts and be like, well, why do I think that way? No, like let's, Let's stop. Take a break from the group you're around and go walk and think on this for a second. Don't go, like, too far. Like, give yourself some boundaries. Don't think about it too long. One of my coworkers, I loved what she said one time. She was like, if I'm ever depressed, I give myself a day. I give myself a day to be depressed and kind of sort through my thoughts. But if it, if it lingers for longer than that, then I have a problem. Then I need to, like, do some more work on it and, like, figure some other things out. Probably seek a little therapy, some counseling, what have you. But otherwise, everybody, I also believe that everybody has the resources and the tools that they need endogenously to sort themselves out. And I feel like I did learn that from Carl Jung and, and those things, those topics I brought up earlier when I was really searching for something. I was really searching for the way to hold on to my mind and not wanting to, like, end this channel, so to speak. Can you describe that DMT experience and um, the first one? Yeah, the one where you ended up taking back the wrong lesson. Well, well, it wasn't it wasn't so much the trip itself it's because it was it was the experience was beautiful, but it was just the weight of realizing. Well, and then a couple trips later, I have the experiences of ego death and 
and some other really heavy things. And this association, so it wasn't until like a trip or two later when things were like settling in that I was just having these really heavy notions of, but yeah, so I mean, no, you're totally right. And there, there is the potentiality for people to, for it to be a hindrance. I was like, I'm, and yeah, and so I guess I'm, I'm glad I said something because that was me. I'm probably the good living example of maybe that not being such a good idea. But at the same time, I mean, it's going to be hard regardless dealing with that, with depression. But I do feel like ultimately it, it afforded me the, it feels like a cognitive tool. I feel like if people go into it with that notion and are like stoked on it, every time I've done DMT since, it's just pure elation and like a refresh. And it really does help me observe some of the things like my hangouts. So there's people, kind of sounds like you, I kind of believe I'm one of those people that are able to take a step back. Also sounds like your friend who Mm -hmm. can take a step back and actually uh, recognize that they're in a certain state and then mull it over and try to do their own therapy. I think there's other people, um, I used to be one of these people, or there's times when I have been, and I forget sometimes, and I revert back to this person, Mm -hmm. who who forgets or who doesn't know how to do that, who doesn't know how to actually sit beside themselves and collect their thoughts. They feel better if they're, if they just kind of avoid them and do something else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess that's why everyone needs access to a counselor or a therapist, like every single human being does. And not, not your best friend, not someone that you think you can tell everything to and call them up and not ask them and then just dive into like a bunch of heavy shit. A person who they can trust and be open with and just, just spew themselves onto. Every single person needs that, like regardless of how good your mental state is. Yeah, I would say that that's, a, that's kind of what psychedelic assisted therapy attempts. They attempt to yeah. get the person to feel comfortable with opening up, and yeah. then they place another person in that room to allow them to open up too. Yes. Totally. I've never done psychedelic assisted therapy, but I kind of imagine that's what it would be like. And in Michael Pollan's book, it seems like it's kind of like that, where the therapist is just like, just open up, just let it flow. You know what's interesting is I actually unintentionally fulfilled that role on a couple of occasions that I've guided people on on uh, psychedelic experiences. Can if you describe I, that? If I, if I didn't feel like I was a stress bucket anxious person, I would think that I could potentially be a, a decent guide for for uh, psychedelic assisted sessions. Um, basically, honestly, it's just all I found was just really bringing it down, being super calm with the person, letting them know it's going to be okay, that I'm here. If you want to hold my hand, my hand is right next to yours. Um just let the waves roll over you. It'll be intense. Not that I was trying to do this, but there was like a couple people where I just fell into this role with them because they were not apprehensive, but they were just, um, like they were wanting to do it, but they were just kind of, uh, just about to dip their toe in. So they just wanted just any sort of small level of assistance. Just being next to a person and calmly emitting a calm energy, like being aware of being emitting a calm energy, makes all the difference. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. However, I, I do think that it is difficult to, to make that happen. How, yeah. how, do you, how do you know, especially if you're under the influence too, which... Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, I, I'm never... I, I, I alternate. I don't, like, I would never be under the effects at the same time that the person is doing it. Not even a light dose to kind of start to get into that realm. Well, no, I mean, no, basic. well, I mean, maybe, I mean, there's, there's definitely been times where I'll, I'll smoke and then it's the next person's turn. And I'm basically, I've basically come back down. It's like the 15 minutes are over and I'm basically back and I'm elated and excited, but I can cool myself and the next person is about to dive in kind of thing. So it's, it's never been while I was under the effect at the same time.
also the way that you're describing it, I was kind of thinking of psilocybin or LSD. But what you're what you just described with the, with the smoking, you're speaking of DMT and actually oh, using yeah. DMT yeah. as as a tool to allow people to open up. People have opened up to you on DMT. Oh yeah. Oh for sure. I like I've done DMT with um, quite a few people, and in the fact, I think one of the first times, I think in like the first five sessions. I had done it with one of my old uh, college professors from UW, and and he, uh, man, it was it was really beautiful. It was like, like see, that's the thing. It's incredibly empathogenic, um, not to not to like an alarming degree where MDMA like makes me feel way too fucking empathetic. I feel too much as like a sober person. <laughs> 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 uh, so that shit was intense. But I mean, but just just the amount of what he and I shared with so with so little being said, just being there for somebody and kind of a uh, fuck. I mean, he. I mean, most of what he needed was just a hand, an outreached hand, you know, and kind of just pooling my calm energy through through my my arm. Is that like a pheromone thing when you're just aware of how, I mean, this was happening last night. My friend, she was, you know, you're, you're really stressed out right now. Like your energy is really amped up. And I'm like, I'm like, what is that? Is that when you get really upset or when you get really calm, what is happening to your body? Is, is that a surge of hormones? Is it adrenaline? What are these different chemicals and what's happening when you decide to like really chill that out so basically i don't know to make a, a long story short there's been a couple occasions where i was able to uh just be there for somebody i think most of the time that's what any human or entity needs or wants this episode was produced by me philip johnson music was written produced and generously donated by vox mod Look for his music on Spotify, iTunes, and voxmod.com. A list of all songs used can be found in the description section of this episode. If you liked what you heard today, please subscribe. Also, leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. Lastly, if you have a story and you'd like to share it, I'd love to hear it. You can email me at psychotropic podcast at hotmail.com. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time.